rapidly approaching our lunch break, but I am about to introduce a Byron Hambly of Blockstream onto the stage because we've had a talk about aqua and liquid and a little bit of lightning, but we haven't really gone into the nitty gritty. We haven't understood what these layer two or low twos on Bitcoin really mean. So I'm hoping that Byron from Blockstream, who's the guy that is literally writing the code behind liquid and lightning as well, or just liquid? Just liquid. Okay, it's a liquid maxi. Is that a thing? It's a thing now. Let's start it. Liquid Maxi, Byron Hamley, come on down. Please welcome him to the stage. You one of these or this? Yeah, I'm going to use this one. Okay, great. I'll take this. Hello, Mike. Mike, check. Sound all right? All right. Hey guys, I'm Byron. As Joe said, uh, I work on Liquid at Blockstream, and my talk is Layer Twos, uh, which is we believe fairer Bitcoin for the global South. Um, so, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Byron Hambly. I was born and raised in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I've been working as a software developer at Blockstream for the last couple of years. I work on the Liquid team, doing mostly Rust and C++ code. And like many people, I have a story of uh, coming for the number go up and staying for the revolution, right? You can find me on the website formerly known as Twitter, at Byron Hambly, where I post about Bitcoin and programming, uh, mostly in the form of memes. My hobbies include electronics, heavy music, chess, and romantic walks on the beach. Not that there's many of those in Joburg. All right, so what are we talking about when we're talking about the global south? It's not exactly the geographical southern hemisphere, but it does include most of it. As you can see, uh, it's an economic classification of less developed countries that have much lower incomes and much higher rates of poverty and unemployment. These countries have very limited education and health systems and greater population density. They also generally have higher rates of inflation, no doubt due to the systemic issues from years of colonialism, corruption, deficit spending, and monetary debasement. The difference in income is staggering. As you can see from these figures, incomes in the global south can be up to 25 times lower than in the north and more. This is also adjusted for purchasing power parity, which means that the figures are actually inflated for places with a lower cost of living. And since these are median incomes, it means that 50% of people actually earn less than this. It's a really stark contrast. Looking at this old data for South Africa, you have a median of about $5,500 a day a year, sorry, which is only $15 a day. Again, half of South Africans earn less than that. I'm, I don't know how people survive. So during the most recent transaction surge on Bitcoin, fee rates were as high as 600 sats per virtual byte, which meant that a priority traction was $40. I think it's obvious that that's far too expensive for the global south if you have to pay multiple days of your wage for one on-chain transaction. Why do fees get so expensive? Well, fees are an auction for the block space. When there are many transactions competing to get into the next block, fees rise dramatically, as we've seen in the last year. And fundamentally, a blockchain is a very inefficient database. There are many, many layers of redundancy to reduce trust on any single participant, but you pay for that in the inefficiency of the system, the data transport and storage. Uh, what's called the blockchain trilemma means that you have this trade-off between security, scalability, and decentralization. You can only pick two, and security is non-negotiable, really unless you're a shitcoin role-playing as real money. Since censorship resistance is so important, 
Bitcoin prioritizes decentralization over scalability. This was cemented in the 2017 block size war when the node runners successfully defended Bitcoin's decentralization from the cartel of miners and corporations who were trying to hard fork to increase the block size. Even though our SegWit soft fork did afford us more block space, it is still an extremely scarce resource. As the block subsidy halves every four years, it's expected that eventually there will be consistently high fees on the base layer. So to stay decentralized, Bitcoin must scale in layers. What is a layer two? Well, it's a solution, it's a method of conducting multiple transactions off the chain, eventually reconciling that balance to the base layer. By scaling transaction throughput, layer twos can have lower fees, faster transactions, and enhanced privacy. But there's no free lunch. Layer twos must have some trade-offs for these improvements. If there was an easy, trustless, decentralized way to scale without any trade-offs, then that would just be incorporated into Bitcoin itself. So remember the trilemma. To stay secure, increases in scalability on Bitcoin will come at the cost of decentralization. The best known options for layer twos today are Lightning and Liquid, and soon to include the Fediment protocol. Fedi is an alpha, I'm looking forward to checking that out. So let's go through a little bit about how layer twos work. Lightning is a network of interconnected nodes which open payment channels with each other by creating a collaborative base layer transaction. While the channel is open between two nodes, many payments can be made in either direction as long as there's sufficient liquidity on the sending side. Since these updates are atomic, if the network is well connected, then payments can find a route from one peer all the way to another one over, over a number of hops. This scales beautifully with the number of peers running Lightning nodes and the number of open channels in the network. As we've seen in the last year, River put out a report, massive increases in the number of Lightning transactions and the ease of getting payments through from peer to peer. When a channel is closed, the balance between the two peers is again settled to the base layer. And this means that Lightning has nearly instant transactions with very low fees. Liquid works a bit differently. Uh, it, it runs its own blockchain as a side chain to Bitcoin. And this side chain is run by a geographically dispersed federation of members that have economic incentives to keep the network honest and secure. The software running the side chain is called Elements, which is a fork of Bitcoin Core. And it's got additional features and it is maintained each year to catch up with with Bitcoin Core, uh, and it also has these additional features like confidential transactions. The primary feature is the ability to verify that the Bitcoin held by the Federation is one for one with the liquid Bitcoin on the side chain. That's what we call a federated peg. So the Bitcoin is pegged in by being sent to the Federation, which unlocks the same amount of liquid Bitcoin on the side chain. To peg out, the liquid Bitcoin is provably destroyed and the same amount of Bitcoin is sent to the recipient from the Federation. Users can freely run their own copy of elements to verify the network and to peg in and to transact without permission. And the liquid sidechain has faster block times of one minute and the ability to issue new assets like stable coins as you saw Ben mentioned, USD Tether is on there. They've got a Japanese stablecoin as well as liquid CAD and I believe a Euro stablecoin as well. And as well as tokenized securities, which is something that Blockstream is doing with the Bitcoin mining note uh, and now the basic notes as well. Liquid also has enhanced privacy with confidential transactions where the asset types and amounts are blinded and hidden to everyone except 
the sender and receiver. You can, for verification purposes, if you need a third party to verify, you can give them a copy of the blinding key to also see the value and type of the transaction. Now, fees are very low uh, on Liquid because the base fee, right, fee rate is 10 times lower than on Bitcoin. And obviously, since fees have been low on Bitcoin historically, you know, there's, there's not been that much uptake, but uh, now with, with higher fee rate environments, we're seeing quite a significant uptick in usage on Liquid. And it's also, if the, if the fees on Liquid start to get very high, it's also much easier to make scalability improvements without any changes to Bitcoin itself. We've, yeah, as I say, we've seen a lot, a lot of new transactions on Liquid in the past year. And I think a lot of people are using it to swap from Lightning to Liquid and use it sort of in between. All right, how does Fediment work? Fediment is a protocol that allows communities to create their own federations. These federations run a Chaumian eCash Mint, and invited users can join the Fediment, send their Bitcoin to the federation, and receive private eCash notes, which are redeemable for that Bitcoin. There are bearer tokens, and they can be sent directly between the members of the Fediment, or they can rede be redeemed from the Federation for Bitcoin. Now, the Federation is also able to confirm when those notes are redeemed without knowing who is redeeming them or what the values are. And, and so, in this way, the Federation can uh, prevent double spending of these notes. Fediment is also natively interoperable with Lightning, and so the Federation can use a Lightning gateway to pay Lightning invoices and receive Lightning, and the gateway operator is doing the exchanges from the eCash to Lightning. So that's the high level of their features, but what are their respective trade-offs? On Lightning, you've got the ongoing work of channel management with your peers, and balancing the available capacity of each channel. I think anyone that's managed a Lightning node can attest to just how much work that is. Liquid can actually help here with tools like peer swap that enable channel balancing with atomic swaps. And Lightning nodes must also be online to receive payments, which is sort of why custodial Lightning is an easier first step and they also have significant uptime and reliability requirements. Additionally, your private keys also need to be online for the Lightning node, since the updates to the channel state have to be signed. Forced channel closures result in a loss of funds penalty, and even cooperative closures are subject to the fee environment of the base layer. On Liquid, you're trusting the Federation with custody, and that means that at least 11 of the 15 functionary operators have to honor your peg out transaction to get back to the main chain. As I say, they have economic and reputational incentives to make sure that happens, but there's still a trade-off there. There's only ever been one issue with block production on Liquid, which was in 2021 during the Dynafed hard fork, and that was caused by a bug that was quickly resolved and it was purely due to the difficulty of the upgrade and not through any censorship. That upgrade changed the ability for Liquid to um, swap in and out members of that 15 member federation running the functionaries if necessary. Since it's also a blockchain, Liquid can have similar scaling issues to Bitcoin but it's more feasible to have soft or hard forks and scalability improvements on the side chain than on Bitcoin itself. And speaking of Fediment, it also requires that you trust the community federation with multi-sig custody of your Bitcoin. And there's also the risk that the federation can debase the eCash notes by minting more than their reserves, essentially playing fiat fractional reserve games with depositors. There are some proof of liabilities schemes being researched, but these also require users to constantly verify those proofs of their mint. The graphic is showing you the trade-off between Liquid and Lightning, 
where Lightning is faster and more trustless, but Liquid is more private and more secure since you can keep your keys offline in a hardware signer like a Blockstream shared. Personally, I see Liquid as a checking account between Lightning and Bitcoin. It can be used to help manage your Lightning liquidity with trustless swaps through a service like Bolts Exchange or the new Aqua Wallet by Jan3. And Liquid is very useful for managing your UTXOs and consolidation during high fee environments on the base layer and then moving to cold storage Bitcoin when those fee rates drop or when your stack reaches a threshold where it makes sense to pay the base layer fee. So layer twos are the first step to scaling Bitcoin to the global south. We want Bitcoin to be accessible to those that need it most. The people who are most affected by inflation and need to save their purchasing power. The people who need permissionless, censorship resistant, digital money that cannot be debased. Layer twos provide us all with options. The option to have instant micropayments on Lightning the option to use Liquid for consolidation or swapping to USD Tether to manage the volatility of Bitcoin. The option to have enhanced privacy and the option to have lower fees for people that earn a fraction of the income of those in the first world. The easiest way to get started is to download the new Aqua Wallet by Jan3 or Blockstream Green where you can use Bitcoin, Lightning, Liquid, USD Tether and more. So if you'd like to know anything more about Liquid, please find me, ask me questions. I'd love to talk about it. And uh, you can find all of these links on liquid.net. Come follow us on Twitter and uh, do all that stuff. And so that's how I think layer twos are fair Bitcoin for the global south. Uh, thank you so much to the conference organizers, to all the attendees and all the Bitcoiners. Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you. Amazing. Well done, Byron. That was great. Really good stuff. Really interesting to hear about L2s in the Global South. Uh, one quick announcement. Um, this is to the people in the room and also to the people on the live stream at home. If you're on the live stream and you park your scooter out front, please remove it. Is that anyone's scooter? No? Well, where's the camera? Live stream? Naughty people. Make sure you remove the scooter from outside there. Um, it's been there for the past uh, day, so I'm guessing it's someone that got drunk last night and forgot about it. But okay, it's none of you guys. Cool, okay, I believe that we're scheduled for a quick break just now. Let me just double check, I got caught with my hands empty there, one second. We are Saturday, I believe it's break time. Is it break time? Cool, thanks, I'll just ask you guys next time. It's much, much quicker that way. So please do enjoy your lunch, I've just seen it and it's all out there, it looks fantastic. Enjoy that, and we'll be back here for whatever the time it says on the sheet that I couldn't read just now. Thanks so much, everyone. I need a coffee. <laughs>